since 2004, there have been over 1,800 suicide attacks around the world. And they've been not scattered around the world, but concentrated in the areas of our occupation. Think about this for a moment. From 1980 to 2003, 300 attacks. Since 2004, 1,800 attacks. Six times as many in a quarter of the time. And again, concentrated in the areas of our occupation. The more we've occupied to try to stop the terrorism, the more terrorists we've produced. Donald Rumsfeld famously asked five years ago, are we producing more terrorists than we're killing? The answer is clearly yes. We're producing more terrorists than we're killing. Um, also notice how many are anti, uh, well, how many are anti-American? In the year 2000, that is the year before 9-11, there were 20 suicide attacks around the world. One anti-American inspired against the U.S. coal. One, five percent. Last year, 300 suicide attacks around the world, 270 against Americans or people working with or for America. Ladies and gentlemen, the world of suicide terrorism isn't just getting bigger. It's becoming nearly all anti-American suicide terrorism. This is not a healthy thing for us, for Americans or for our country. This is not a good trend. Now, for these patterns to be wrong, our team would have had to have missed not just five suicide attacks around the world, or even 50. With over 2,200 data points, our team would have had to have missed hundreds of suicide attacks around the world since 2004 that are occurring in some country not on this chart. I don't mean an extra 200 in Iraq or less in Iraq. I mean a 200 attacks in Bangladesh, 200 attacks in Mozambique, 200 attacks in South Africa, 200 attacks in uh, Brazil. I cannot swear to you that we've literally got every single attack, although I really don't think we've missed even five. And if you think we've missed any attacks, you just go ahead, send me an email. Man, our team there, that's what they do. <laughs> we're awfully glad to just put that right in the database, get the verify it up. Uh, we're all up for modifying the database. Um, but I'm sure, and the Admiral staff is sure, our intelligence services are sure, and a lot of folks on Capitol Hill are sure, there haven't been 200 that we've missed since 2004. You would know that. You would know that. And that, is, that means that we have tremendous confidence in the robustness of this finding. Tremendous confidence. Now, let me talk about a couple of the, event, a couple of the specific cases, because you're going to ask questions about them. And why don't we just um, uh, talk about first Iraq. Iraq is a prime example of the strategic logic of suicide terrorism that you're seeing. Before our invasion in March 2003, Iraq never experienced a suicide attack in its history. Since then, it went up and then peaked in 2007 and came down in this distinctive two-step pattern. Why did it come down and why in this two-step pattern? Well, the first thing you need to know about um, Iraq is that during this period, there aren't, weren't just one, wasn't one type of conflict, but two. First, there was an ordinary three-sided civil war where Shia, Sunni, and Kurds were killing each other with ordinary attacks alongside one-sided Sunni-only suicide terrorism. All the suicide attacks in Iraq were Sunni suicide attacks. We don't have a single Shia suicide attacker or a Kurdish suicide attacker. Think about that for a moment. We have plenty of Shia Islamic fundamentalist militants in Iraq. Sadr, the Sadr Brigade, 20,000 strong, no suicide attacks. Why, why, why the Sunnis? And of course, because they're not, it's not religion. <laughs> Why the Sunnis? Because it's helpful to remember Saddam wasn't just a dictator, he was a Sunni. When we toppled Saddam, we toppled the Sunnis from running Iraq. And who would take over? 
either an American government or a Shia-dominated government, but either way, it's the Sunnis who are most put out by our occupation, and it's the Sunnis doing suicide terrorism. But why does it come down? And why does it come down in this distinctive two-step pattern, 07 to 08 and then 08 to 09? Well, many people might say, oh, 07 to 08, uh, Professor Pape, there's a good explanation for that, the surge. We surged 21,000 troops into Iraq during that window, and that's what brought down the Sunni suicide terrorism. Well, let's look at that hypothesis of the surge using the Pentagon's own numbers. So, September 06 to September 08, that's the window of the surge. If we look at the first column, that's U.S. and allied troops overall in the country. Notice how the numbers go down during the surge. How can that be? Because our allies were leaving faster than we were putting troops in the country. For the country as a whole, we were backfilling for the loss of our allies. But wait a minute, maybe we put them in the Sunni area. The Sunnis live in Anbar province, that's called the Sunni Triangle. So maybe, even though the numbers are going down, we put them in the Sunni area to bring down the Sunni suicide terrorism. Let's look at that. We do put a few more thousand troops in, 34 to 38K, but nowhere near the 100,000 troops we would have had to put into that area according to General Petraeus's counterinsurgency manual. Uh, I'm very familiar with that manual because it was published by the University of Chicago Press, and I was the key reviewer who argued in favor of publishing that manual. Uh, this is not anti-troops, this is not anti-General Petraeus, this is not anti-counterinsurgency doctrine, it's just we didn't do counterinsurgency doctrine. <laughs> That's not what we did. The real change that occurred in Anbar is in the last column called the Sons of Iraq, also called the Anbar Awakening. What we essentially did is we took 100,000 insurgents, that is terrorists, who were trying to kill us, and we paid them $300 a month to do one thing, don't kill us. Now, you could take your $300 a month, and we hope you go get a job with it. You could take that $300 and, okay, if you go buy some guns, we'll turn a blind eye to it. But the one thing you can't do if you want your next paycheck for $300, don't kill us. <laughs> that policy worked very, very well. Basically, we used economic means and political means to locally empower the Sunnis, large fractions of the Sunnis, so that they had the autonomy to defend themselves. To defend themselves either against the Shia-dominated government, or against the terrorists, or yes, ladies and gentlemen, even against us. This policy was very controversial at the time. Why? Many argued if we give the money to uh, those terrorists, they'll buy guns and shoot us, turn on us. Uh, that's not what they did. Why? Because they were motivated by deep insecurity, because they were worried about the loss of their way of life. What the occupation meant to the Sunnis is losing their ability to control their social institutions, their economic institutions, their religious institutions, going forward on their own. By economically empowering large hunks of the Sunni community, they now had the wherewithal to secure their way of life into the future, and they therefore gave up the violence. Very, very important. That's what accounts for the decline of about half of that suicide terrorism, about 40%. Then, what happened in 08 to 09? November 2008, that's when we signed the withdrawal accords with the Iraqi government. And we have since pulled out over 100,000 ground troops from Iraq. And what's been the result? At the time, when we were talking about this, you might remember three years ago, people argued, oh, if we pull out a single soldier, we'll have a second caliphate on the Arabian Peninsula. We'll embolden the terrorists uh, to march on us. What's happened since we have pulled out? Suicide terrorism is dropping like a rock down over 85% from the peak. That is, the more we've withdrawn our ground forces, the more we're putting the terrorists out of business. There, that's why we're not talking about Iraq anymore. <laughs> it's become the good war as we've withdrawn 
and diminished the occupation. But what about Afghanistan? That's now become the bad war. You'll remember that in the early years it was the good war. What happened? Well, the first thing to note about Afghanistan is, again, this is a prime example of the logic I'm talking to you about today. Before the fall of 2001, when we toppled the Taliban, Afghanistan never experienced a suicide attack in its history. Then, you can see, for the first few years, there's a tiny number of attacks. That's when it's the good war. And then suddenly, 2006, kaboom, it spikes up. There's a huge number of suicide attacks, and they stay high in the coming years, even during the Obama surge. They have not come down during the Obama surge. In fact, per attack, they're more deadly. Why is that, and why did they suddenly spike up in 2006? Did the Taliban suddenly become religious in 2006? <laughs> what happened here in 2006 to explain that change? Uh, the first thing we need to know are the targets of the suicide attack. The green are US and NATO troops. About 83% of all the targets of the suicide attacks in Afghanistan are US and NATO troops. But why 2006 are there suddenly a large number of suicide attacks against US and NATO troops? Let's look at who's doing the suicide attacks in Afghanistan. We can identify and corroborate the identities of 93 of the suicide attackers in Afghanistan. We think that's a high number because uh, last April, Army intelligence from Kabul contacted us and they said they had about 50 in their secret database. What did we have in ours? Uh, well, we had um, a lot more in our open source database, which, which we have a lot broader uh, sources we can choose from. Um, and the fact of the matter is, when we gave them the data, they wrote back, we don't get to see their data because it's secret, but they did write back that the patterns were comparable. Um, and what is the pattern? 90% are Afghan nationals, and not just any old Afghan nationals, they're Pashtuns. No Uzbeks, no Hazaris. 5% are nationals from the border countries of Afghanistan, and only 5% are coming from beyond the region of conflict. This is not some global jihad swirling around the world looking for a place to strike. This is regional opposition to American and Western military presence. And in fact, if I showed you the pattern for Iraq, you'd see a very similar pattern there as well. But what accounts, why are Pashtuns suddenly wanting to do suicide attacks against US and NATO troops from 2006 on in such large numbers? What happened? Well, it has something to do with military forces, but not a linear relationship as you might think. Because occupation is more a step function than a linear function. But let me just first of all show you the draw up curve of our ground forces uh, in Afghanistan. And as you can see, first, it's kind of this steady incremental increase. Obama's surge in 2010 was nothing new. That was just simply the last surge of over 20,000 troops into the country in recent years. There's nothing special about the Obama surge. Um, but what happened here, most important, is to notice in these early years, we not only had a few number of troops in the country, they were only in Kabul, the capital city, not spread around the rest of the country. They were there essentially as Karzai's personal security guard because we were terrified Karzai would get assassinated. You see, Karzai was not our first choice. The CIA picked Karzai to put him in power. He was not living in Afghanistan, but he was our second choice. <laughs> our first choice you haven't heard about, uh, his name is Ghul, G-U-L. Uh, you can find out about him on the internet, and you'll find in October 2001, as we're starting to uh, work with the Northern Alliance, the CIA starts the secret in uh, Ghul into the country, and the Taliban get him and send him back to Langley in boxes. <laughs> um, uh, and so he was killed, um, and Karzai was our second choice. And so we were very concerned that he would be assassinated.